Hello everyone, and welcome to Software Architecture Monday. My name is Mark Richards. In this lesson, I'm going to show you the difference between atomic transactions and eventual transactions within a distributed architecture. Uh, you can get a listing of all the lessons I do in Software Architecture Monday through my website, uh, developer2architect.com slash lessons. And speaking of lessons, way back in Lesson 109, I talked about base transactions and eventual consistency. Now, in this lesson, I really focused on those eventual consistency patterns, but really didn't describe why distributed transactions don't support ACID. Well, in this lesson, I want to dive a little deeper into this uh, idea of transactions and really show, first of all, why distributed transactions don't support ACID properties, but what it means also to be atomic in a distributed architecture. When we talk about ACID transactions, uh, these are transactions that we have within a monolithic system, for example, or a large service. Uh, for example, this order processing service. When I place an order, I insert an order. I, of course, insert into the payment table that I apply to payment, and I adjust all the inventory. ACID transactions, atomicity, consistency, isolation, and durability, uh, mean first that this transaction is atomic. All of these updates occur, or none of them occur. Uh, we're very familiar with this with the usual commits and rollbacks we do after a series of database updates. So we do have atomicity. We also have three other things, though. We have consistency, which really means that during the course of this request, that's where the transaction boundary is, the data is always, first of all, guaranteed to be consistent. It's either committed or rolled back as a single unit, but also all of the database constraints are applied. For example, if I have a foreign key constraint um, between order and payment, what that means is I cannot insert a payment without inserting the order first because it needs to have that foreign key constraint. And that's what consistency really means. Isolation means that during the course of this transaction, this request to place an order, you see the user hasn't received the information back yet that the order has been placed. All those inserts and updates that I do are not visible to the outside world. That's what isolation means. And finally, durability means that after I commit all of these updates, those updates are guaranteed to survive any system failures. Okay, well, let's talk about distributed transactions now. If we were to take that order processing service I just showed you and break it up into three different services, order placement, payment, and inventory, what happens is this. We no longer have ACID transactions. We no longer have atomicity because each of these database updates are separately committed or separately rolled back. We can't form those into a single unit of work or single group. Oh, we don't have consistency. If a failure occurs, let's say with inventory, uh, the request ends and I have data that's inserted into order and payment when I haven't adjusted inventory. My data is inconsistent. And as a matter of fact, consistency is not supported at the database level because payment may in fact have some sort of relationship with another kind of entity that we cannot enforce because it's not in a single unit of work. Isolation is also not supported. During the course of placing an order, during that transaction, I can view and retrieve that order even though I'm not done with this transaction yet. And finally, durability is not supported. This unit of work does not survive any system failures because it's at the transaction level. And this is where I defined in Lesson 109 base transactions. Distributed transactions are referred to as base, basic availability, soft state, and eventual consistency. 
Well, that's all well and good. But what if I still need atomic transactions in a distributed architecture? Can I support that? And the answer is yes, we can simulate atomicity. And that's what I want to show you in this lesson. So when we talk about atomicity, atomic transactions in a distributed architecture, Picture this scenario here uh, where I've got three domain services that are all involved in this particular transaction and an orchestration service that kind of coordinates all of that work. Well, let's do a transaction. So in the happy path, the user submits a request to the orchestrator and waits. Let's say we're maybe placing an order. Well, the orchestrator now says, oh, let me make my first update, and my second update. Now it's interesting, this update is not necessary for the user to wait, but because it's atomic, in other words, that transaction scope is at the request level. That means that I actually have to wait for that update to occur. That user has to wait. Now that everything is done, finally, now, we can get back to the user and say, okay, everything's good. But what happens when errors occur? We still need an atomic transaction. That means all or nothing. Again, notice that the request or the transaction scope is at the request level. So user makes a request, goes into the orchestration. Orchestrator says, okay, make an update there, make an update there. We have to make the third one, but it fails. What happens? Because the transaction boundary is at the request level here, that means I have to clean everything up during the scope of that request. That's what it means to be atomic in a distributed transaction. And how that occurs, first of all, the user is still waiting. I have to apply some sort of compensating update to the second domain service, a compensating update to have that domain service reverse itself. Don't forget, that data has already been committed. I can't just issue a rollback. And now that everything is in an inconsistent state, then and only then can I say to the user, an error has occurred and that user is done. That's the nature and the trade-offs of an atomic transaction in distributed architectures. Now, the difference between that and eventual consistency is as follows. Notice that the transaction boundary here is at the service level, not at the request level. That's the big difference. And let me illustrate for you what happens on both a happy path as well as when errors occur. User makes a request has to wait for it. Notice it goes to the first domain service. That update is committed. Goes to the second domain service. That update is committed. Now we still have work to do. And the orchestrator says, yeah, I, st I still have some work I need to do. And it's involving this service. But why make the user wait for that? Because we don't have atomic transactions, what I can do at this point is tell the user, okay, thank you. We've got some more work to do, but we're not gonna bother you with that. So that's the advantage of eventual consistency because now the user's gone and now we apply other necessary updates for that processing. So you can see even in happy path, eventual consistency is much more efficient. But let's take a look at errors and see how this impacts the end user. We make that same request user waits, goes to domain service one, applies an update, applies an update. Now we go to update this domain service and it fails. Unlike atomic transactions though, we immediately tell the user, oh, we had an error. So I'm going to let you know as soon as possible, but we're not going to make you wait. We'll, we'll, we'll clean everything up for you. That's what it means to be eventually consistent. 
and whether that's within the next couple of milliseconds or throughout the day, <laughs> we, we now issue those same reversing transactions, those compensating updates, to be able to start cleaning things up eventually so that we're now in a consistent state. And that's where those patterns I talked about in Lesson 109 came into. <laughs> I suppose everybody, in hindsight, I probably should have done this lesson first and then the eventual consistency patterns. And so you can, if you haven't seen Lesson 109, you can certainly watch this one first and then see the patterns to make things eventually consistent. <laughs> so, so this has been Lesson 169, uh, Atomic versus Eventual Transactions uh, Within a Distributed Architecture. So stay tuned in two more weeks for the next lesson in Software Architecture Monday.